uh, good evening. I'm Susan Sontag, and I want to uh, welcome you this evening for uh, a very special evening. All, all, all our pen evenings are special evenings, um, but this one seems especially special. Before I say a few words about our speaker, about whom the proverbial nothing need be said because you know who he is and your being here uh, is witness to that fact, and also about whom so much could be said that I might not give him a chance to speak, I want to thank uh, Peter Glasgow and his team, the, the translation project, I guess it could be called, uh, who've had uh, the ambition and, and uh, the energy and, uh, if, if I may say, the intellectual class uh, to set up um, a series of events and programs and, and meetings of which this is surely one of the most uh, distinguished occasions. We're very fortunate to have tonight, as I say, someone who in a sense of course needs no introduction, George Steiner, who is uh, quite simply the, one of the most interesting people around, and by around I mean around the globe, uh, one of the most interesting writers, minds, uh, voices uh, alive today. There are many things that could be said about Mr. Steiner, but in, in one, one way of describing him is that he is, in a sense, uh, homologous with his subject. That is to say, his subject is translation. His subject is the uh, passage of, of, of literary texts, of cultural material, of ideas, of art, of language, of sensibility, of uh, spiritual quest, uh, in, from one language, one culture to another, and and he himself is, as it were, a living uh, a living translation <laughs> or set of translations. Uh, he is someone who, for starters, is uh, is trilingual, seriously trilingual. That is to say, he can claim uh, three native languages uh, in no, in no particular order. Uh, English, French, and German. He is equally at home in all three of these languages. He can write in all three of these languages. He has a um, handsomely international background, uh, multicultural background. I believe his passport is American, but this, uh, if it is true, uh, means uh, it's not anything we can particularly take for, for any credit for except to say that there is also an American uh, part of his background, and perhaps it may be in some sense appropriate, if I'm not mistaken, that he has an American passport, because America itself, of course, is a kind of translation as well. Uh, he's been uh, writing, publishing for uh, 30 years, as we reminded each other uh, uh, tonight. I asked him what the date when we were talking in, in, in the back, what the date of his first book, I knew it was his first book, uh, Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, and I remembered it was the late 50s, and indeed it is 1958. So it's 30 years of work, very different kinds. Uh, he, I won't, I won't give a list of his books. All of you know his writing. Uh, he's, among other things, the the author of a, a fascinating um, novel, uh, the 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 transport of A. H. You you probably know who is uh, um, indicated by those initials, which came out five years ago in 1983. Specifically with respect to translation, he uh, is the author of a, a very famous and influential book called After Babel that uh, came out in 1975. And a also famous and influential 
uh, collection anthology of poetry in translation called in England the Penguin Book of, of Modern Verse Translation. And this, the same book with a different title is available in this country under the title. Um, the, t the title is uh, uh, Poem into Poem. Is that right? Poem into Poem. And that book came out a decade earlier in 1966. Many of you know that he has been for more than two decades a, a regular uh, a reviewer and essayist, and uh, his, his reviews are always uh, ambitious essays which use the book uh, as, as a starting point for larger considerations, has been a, an essayist in the guise of a book reviewer for The New Yorker. And many years ago, uh, I was complimenting George Steiner on, on something that I'd read of his in The New Yorker. I've been a fan for decades and telling him that I always cut his things out when they appear in the New Yorker, and he said, it's a good thing you do because I'm never going to reprint them. They're just journalism. And I thought, if that's just journalism, wouldn't, th wouldn't it be a wonderful world if that really were just journalism? Anyway, up to now, he has maintained this very high-minded principle, and with the exception of one essay, I believe, uh, the rather legendary essay that he wrote on, on Anthony Blunt, has never reprinted any of the thousands of pages that he has uh, published in The New Yorker, which is, I think, some of the best writing he's ever done, but I'm sure he wouldn't agree with me. I think his agent probably agrees with me as well. Uh, anyway, this is just a, 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 a uh, tip to cut the things out of The New Yorker. It may be quite some decades before he consents to collect uh, this material as well, which is some of the most brilliant essay writing being done in any language uh, that I know of, in original language or in translation. He's also told me that he's translated into 14 languages regularly, uh, 10 or 11 everything, and then the other two or three most, and participates whenever he can in, in correcting and working with uh, his translators in, in the translation of his own text. So this is someone who has the, the widest um, uh, range of experience from the theoretical to the practical, from the historical to the philosophical and back for considering the problem of translation, which has to be absolutely central uh, Everyone has ideas about translation, whether they've made them articulate to themselves or not. Uh, the notion of translation and what the possibilities of translation are and what is entailed in translation is a question at the very heart of our culture, as George Steiner himself is someone at the very heart of our culture. George Steiner. Thank you, Susan, ladies and gentlemen. Many years ago, I. A. Richards said the most complex act of which human experience has record is that of a quartet, that the interpenetrations, interactions and enmeshings of a string quartet defy any mathematical, any logical, any formal analysis. But here is an event where an understanding can never be paraphrased. I think the quartet image is suggestive, but indeed almost too elaborate. The immense mystery is the act of translation in the meeting of two human beings. Every human being speaks what linguists call with an awkward word, but we can't do without it, an idiolect. That is to say that the words we use are rooted and rooted at a depth below consciousness, far below consciousness, in a highly individual lexicon of remembrance and association, of hope and fear. And when the other human being encounters our private language, it is always private, the bridges that are built are incomplete, always threatened by misunderstanding, 
And the wondrous strangeness is that there can be what we call commerce or intercourse or communication at all. That there can be at all. All too often it breaks down and breaks down along sharp fault lines, almost geological lines where translation suddenly becomes untenably difficult. For example, as between generations. Generations carry their own language world with them. An older generation finds that the antennae, the tenebrous feelers of its understanding, are increasingly out of touch with the young. The young, in turn, hear in the voices of those older than themselves a lost world. And nowhere is that made more cruel than in the failure of the aspiranto of love, which is the exchange and non-exchange between Lear and Cordelia, where it becomes impossible for the old mad master of words to hear the idiolect of need and of love and of silence in the child. And there is no one who has not in a family heard a door slam when a teenager walks out of the room into silence who does not know the weapon of misunderstanding which lies in the attempt to communicate shared meaning where there is refusal. Political ideologies have fought by appropriating each other's words within the same language. Long before Orwell's classic analysis, Joseph de Maistre showed how in the French Revolutionary Crisis and in the Terror, both sides took the key words, peace, freedom, enfranchisement, and law, in order to give them precisely opposite meanings and to give to the exact opposition of meaning the sharp knife edge of the offensive so as to put the other person into the position of the babbler, of the helpless student of his own language, to exile him from any confidence in the use of his own words. And there is no more fierce exile. Religious face, a bitter remark of Spinoza, that there is no struggle between heretic and orthodox, between believer and unbeliever, between the same wings within a church that could not be resolved if there had been an agreement on the grammar of meaning. That is Spinoza's remark. Of course, there can be no such agreement. The grammars that clash, the grammars that clash as acts of faith and of credo speak to each other in what the French call a dialogue, they sur the dialogue of the deaf. And the stronger that deafness, the louder the voices. Today, supremely, the act of translation between men and women seems to me one of the most complex and tense in history. The feeling of many women that they have never been allowed the inheritance of their own discourse, that they've been thrust into a borrowed discourse, into a speech of servitude, that there is a helots vocabulary which oppresses them, that they are asked to express their aspirations, their anguish, their own profound confusions in a speech which is not their own. This can take forms which you know well in this country, forms in extremis of protest over fundamental categories of grammar, over the very use of the word man, the root word in the language, the word mensch, which has now become a polemic word, tossed back and forth in a mounting exasperation. And we come back again to Shakespeare, who plays here a game of inexhaustible cunning. All Shakespearean women are young men. There were no women actors. In 20 of the plays, we have young men dressed up as women, who then dress up as young men. A triple take whereby Shakespeare, with a control which no other poet has ever attempted, develops a kind of androgynous code of speech, of disguise within disguise. You hear a boy's voice miming a woman who is miming a boy, like Viola, Olivia, 
Helen, Imogen and Symbolin. The mirrors turn around the acts of speech, and Shakespeare alone has been able to exercise a certain control before the breakdown of communication, a breakdown marvelously shown when, for example, as in Symbolin, the man, knowing that there is a music of meaning here that escapes him, shifts into prose, the prosaic as the weapon of power, the prosaic used to enforce a power relation over the virtuosity and the acrobatic dance of the verse, being used this time by what he believes to be a young man, senses to be a woman, back on her way to being a young man. Thus there is a sense, and I'm not urging a paradox, it seems to me a commonplace, a banality. There is a sense in which translation between different languages is far easier, far more accessible than within our own single tongue. And when we translate between different languages, we always know too little, far too little, not even the greatest translator has more than a preliminary entry into the idiolectic world, the inherited world, the sleepwalker's confidence of a native speaker, the way a native speaker moves in the dark, feeling his way by complexities of association and remembrance which the outsider can never finally master, we know too little, and because we know too little, we sense a certain freedom and hope burgeons within that ignorance, and thank God we go ahead and do the best we can without knowing how bad a job it usually is, whereas in our own language, the breakdown of communication, the failure to translate, can be ineluctable, and there is no escape from it. In certain great works of art, there are parables of translation within themselves. They enact, they dramatize the problem of translation. This is surely not to be wondered at. What great poet has not asked himself about his relation to other tongues? What great poet has not wondered whether his work would be finally banished into the singularity of a lost language, or whether it would reach the dubious but vital life rafts which throw it outward into other languages. The thought haunts the beginnings of our Western literature, as far as we know. There is a passus in Pindar where Pindar roughly says that his verse will certainly outlive the men who have commissioned it. That's proud, and these men were rich men and princes and warriors. It was a proud thing to say, but fair enough, not a difficult point to make. The second point is already much more audacious. He says they will outlive the city in which they are sung. That's already a much stronger thing to say. And then comes the leap, the quantum leap of the poet's hubris and dreaming arrogance. They may outlive the language in which they are composed. That, as far as we know, is about the first time that the quantum jump to the possibility of translation as immortality is actually envisaged. So many great poems, epics, have within themselves acts of complex translation. In Dante's Divine Comedy, where there are 17 major poets met, discussed with, the meditation on translation is that of the poem itself, from Virgil to Dante, from the Provencal masters whom he meets in the Inferno and the Purgatorio, and there is only one single author not translated. The words of God are the only ones that appear in the poem, in the Vulgate text, and without translation. And we'll come back to this point of the untranslatability of the divine. I want tonight to attach these all to abstract and general points to a concrete piece of poetry, to a concrete situation, which is almost, I think, matchless in the depths of its unfolding 
of our whole problems of encounter and of translation. It will tell us something of the bet on the possibility of speech between deadly enemies. Deadly enemies so charged with mutual hatred and bitterness that the very problem of articulacy, of exchanging the supreme trust, which is to speak to another human being, is posed, resolved, but only half resolved. Hatred screams. Hatred goes to the throat of its adversary. Hatred can keep magnificently silent. We destroy other human beings by our silence if we are strong enough. So first we will see posed the question, can there be speech? Can there be the gamble on trust between deadly enemies? We will see age and youth trying to speak to each other extreme age and extreme youth. I mentioned that gap, calling it generational, it goes very much deeper. The speech of the very old, the song of long time in an old person, is charged with something a young person cannot bear to hear, which is, of course, the certitude of imminent death. And the young, the speech of the young, is almost a repudiation, a non-translation of the intimations of death in the old. We will see the exchanges between the language of victory and that of defeat. A victory carries its own vocabulary, its own grammar. We are told often violently and grossly that the histories we know are only the history of the victors, that there are no other texts available to us, a victory seizes the language of its foes, of its vanquished foes, precisely as the great Roman legions took the gods of the captured cities and brought them back to their own pantheon. And finally, we will see a kind of subtle attempt of mutual understanding between the passion of a family world, of a familial world, of a world in which the relationship to one's children is the touchstone of meaning, and that far more elusive, more masked, more guarded form of love within language, which is homosexuality. You will have guessed, I'm sure, a good many of you, I want to look at book 24 of the Iliad, I want to look at the nighttime meeting between Priam and Achilles. In shorthand, we remember the circumstance. Hector, Priam's son, the shield of the city, has been savagely slain by Achilles. And in a rite of vengeance which reaches into the heart of non-communication, which means to take away the very name of the dead. And remember, names are sacred. Nomination is the act of trust between human beings. You are Jacob, I am Israel. You are little John, I am Robin Hood. You are Oliver, I am Roland. The great exchanges of nomination within a language, which means I trust you. I have handed over to you my name and your name is in my hand. The defilement of the body of Hector to make him anonymous, to strip him of his identity, to drag him behind the chariot of Achilles, and guarded by Hermes, who is the god of translation. And this is vital to our scheme. Hermes gives us our complicated but necessary word, hermeneutics, the science of understanding, of decoding. Hermes, the god of translators, and beautifully the god of thieves. And you can see how important it is that he should be both. For all translation is all plagiarism. How could they be otherwise? Hermes guides him through the night to the tent of Achilles, a thing daring beyond words, and the old man bursts into the tent with a very young god of war, Mars-like, titanic, is celebrating his victory and prays back for the body of his son. And at first, death is so near that Achilles almost 
destroys him, almost cuts his throat in the obvious reflex of panic at this appearance, and then very, very slowly the complicated bridges are beginning to be built between deadly enemies, both of whom know that they are in different ways doomed. With the death of Hector, Troy will fall. Achilles knows that the fall of Troy is somehow mysteriously inwoven with his own death. Age and youth cross over the young boy, the brute, the Mars, the magnificent Mars, the, the, the untouched lion, sees in the old man his own father whom he will not see again, and in a translatio, an equivocation, inexhaustible to our feelings, the old man sees in the killer, in the young killer, the son he has lost. And this chiasmic figure, as we call it, this crossing over, is another emblem of translation, the appropriation of the other identity from the other language or in your own language, bringing it into your own vision. The victory on Achilles' side, the Greeks will vanquish. And yet, the terrible word of Hegel comes to mind who knew this passage so profoundly. God help those who are in the moment of victory. Only defeat has a certain safety. It's a word which is one of the deepest perceptions in modern politics. Priam on the edge of defeat has no more fear. Achilles and the Greeks in the moment of victory, they do not yet know that their homecomings will be those of catastrophe and murder and adultery and destruction, but they sense it. The children of Priam are his world, the great patriarch, and Achilles is mourning his lover the beautiful Patroclus, and the way in which he has killed his lover's killer is charged with the choreography of the homoerotic, as again it will be in Shakespeare's Troilus and Cressida, when the great opposite champions will pass their hands over each other's body. Another act of translation, the blind man's act of translation, when he passes his hand over the skin and frame of another human being, and the image comes home to him. And in this scene, I want to take a single motif, a single line, in fact, and concentrate tonight on what seems to me a form of translation we pay far too little attention to, which is between body and what we awkwardly call mind. Modern English jargon, it is jargon, but it helps speaks of body language. It is a very recent coinage. It goes back to a central intuition that there is a language of the body. We all know it when pain speaks in us. We really hear it speak then. It drowns out the inner discourse of our self-address. We speak of mysterious motions and pulses of meaning, very complex ones, in the whole parasympathetic nerve system, all those extraordinary nerve ends and osmoses between what we call thought and what we call the visceral experience of the body. Sexuality is the great chosen ground of this act of translation when the sexual and orgasmic moment translates into remembered speech or is held in suspense by the figuration of dreams and desire and spoken images before it is consummated, the meeting place, the membrane between the word and the act. How does our body speak to our mind? How does our mind speak to our body? To what extent is the world of dreams that where the body consents to translate its needs, for example, those of a full bladder, the classical case, into complex and almost mystical images of inundation, of rain, of flowing water. So simple a case, yet so infinitely complex. How does that translation take place? We have no idea. What is the channel whereby the body's ache becomes grammatical, becomes metaphoric, becomes a simile? 
And in our text tonight, we have a supreme moment. The grief of Priam is beyond words. The legend has it 50 children slain. 50, like in the Bible, of course. A canonic numerological symbol. 50 simply means an infinity. There are many families in older cultures who have lost all their sons in wars. And if you've lost two sons or three, that's 50. 50 slain, grief beyond grief. There are no more words. The old man fears that his desolation cannot find expression, will in fact be made somehow less dignified if there is royal eloquence. He breaks down. Achilles, too, has broken down. The memory of his lover, Patroclus, is so intense upon him. He has now, in a sense, done violence to his vow. He had promised Patroclus he would defile Hector, defile him, throw him to the dogs and the vultures. And now he has decided to yield the body to honorable burial, to restore him to Priam and to Troy. So he has violated something. He has violated an oath. He has translated out of a promise into a new promise, which is a falsehood towards the first promise. And at that moment, we come to a very famous motif, that of the body. Achilles will say that there is no end to human sorrow, no end to the saying of human sorrow, but one must eat. There is hunger. Somehow, no grief is finally stronger than the body's ache for food. And I want to look at some of the history of the attempts to cope with this line and a half, because they are, of course, the history of sensibility, of language, of shifting cultures, of shifting ways in which we experience our own bodies the dignity of our bodies or their indignity, the pathos by which we too have to yield in moments of supreme sorrow or elation or joy to something very different, to the rumble in the belly. Different periods have found this either possible to handle or immensely difficult. In the first of the Iliads in English, which is in the 1580s, the famous one of Chapman, into which Keats will look for his sonnet. Chapman denied that it was based on a French and a Latin model. He had a splendid word for his critics, those wind fuckers, which is a magnificent word. He said he knew Greek, and he would show it. And clearly, he's a man who has fought. He's in a period when men met in tents to exchange bodies and ransom. The 1580s are full of very cruel war and personal combat. He knows that world. They said, and he went, and what was done told Priam, saying, Father, and the Father is splendid, father is infinitely perceptive he has seen that in Achilles' eyes the old great enemy has become his father, the far off King Peleus who will not see him again father now thy will fit rights are paid, thy son is given up, in the morn thine eyes shall see him laid decked in thy chariot on his bed in mean space let us eat, very simple let us eat. And he backs his argument. There's a lovely touch here in Homer, in the man we call Homer, in the men we call Homer. Achilles is not a thinker, not a sophist, he's not a logician. He moves towards authority by simply citing another story, a story that will narrate the meaning of eating, that of the queen Niobe. You remember Niobe had mocked, had mocked, a goddess for having only two children. She had mocked Latona for only having Apollo and Artemis, and Apollo and Artemis, the two children, quo uli shot. 
her twelve children dead in front of her with their <laughs> arrows. He takes that legend, the rich-haired Niobe found sorts that made her take her meat, a strangely brutal phrase, that made her take her meat, though twelve dear children she saw slain. And Niobe, when she was tired with tears, fell to her food. Fell to her food is very strong again and very, very profoundly ironic. It's almost the image of an animal falling to its food. And we pause here because here is that wall of translation between the animal and the human. Many ancient thinkers almost postulated the definition of the bestial is that from whose sounds we cannot translate. That is Aristotle's view. And in turn, the animal cannot translate from our speech, and yet other Greeks insisted otherwise and called us, quite simply, the animal that speaks. So on for Nanta. We are an animal that happens to speak. And the stomach, the needs of hunger of the animal night and kingdom, and falling to one's food is the gesture, which will later terribly be that of Hecuba, who will be turned to a howling dog when her grandchildren are tossed living from the walls of the destroyed city and her mind gives and she becomes an enraged dog because only a dog can survive the bestiality of human behavior in victory. So she falls to her food. Hurt, bitterly hurt, by the fact that his masterpiece, the Leviathan, his philosophic masterpiece had received scant notice or welcome. Thomas Hobbes translated Homer. Paused over this passage, more elegant in 1676. Tomorrow with him go by break of day, but let us not our supper now forget. For nigh be twelve children lost, they say, yet did she not for that refuse to eat supper? And the sacramental note, we will see it coming back very strongly, that in that act of forgiveness between the two men and in that act of eating, there is a touch of that last supper, also the supreme trust of breaking bread together. We forget that after Milton, the greatest epic in the English language is Pope's Homer by far. There is no challenge to it after Milton. We take our opinions of it from second hand, most of us. It is a very great text. But now the peaceful hours of sacred night watch the sacred. Demand refection. And we coil back from the Latin exactitude of that word. And to rest invite, nor thou, O Father, thus consumed with woe, the exact consumed, consumed prepares the hunger, we consume food and woe consumes us. The common cares that nourish life forego, nor thus did Naya be a form divine, a parent once, whose sorrows equal thine. He tells the story superbly of Niobe, he expands Pope. It becomes a kind of dance of grief, and he cuts out the line where they actually start eating. And that alone, if we had only that, we would spare ourselves many a bad book on the 18th century. Because cutting out that line tells you in miniature the taboos of the untranslatable. Not in any cheap way. Pope is as strong, as nervously alert a poet as we've ever had. But this is a work in which the magnificence of heroism and the articulate eloquence which it brings with it is undone by the physicality of the food. This is precisely the limes, we would say. This is one of the frontiers that the available discourse cannot cross. Were we to cross it, we would be in some kind of comedia, of rather vulgar and brutal comedia, not within the epic. The functions of evacuation and nourishment are not available to the perception of that vocabulary. And so it is simply cut out. A pope 
has a footnote. Achilles to comfort Priam tells him a known history which surely is very proper in order to work its effects. The gods at last interred Niobe's children and the gods likewise are concerned to procure honorable funeral for the great hero Hector. Yet he avoids again no mention of what he has left out. They will not be seen eating in the very way as certain acts of basic need cannot be shown in public in an ancien regime of high civility. Man who balks at this, angry at Pope's omission, William Cooper, great poet in his own right, domestic, makes extraordinary observation that the only way you can translate this great passage is by looking at Flemish painting. And it's a very extraordinary thing to say in 1791. We will not argue with him over whether it's in fact incisive. It is an extraordinary bringing in of a world of domestic physicality. We know exactly what he means. Flemish painting with a stomach, the sharing of meat, to relieve oneself in the corner of a broidal painting, where the magnificent language of the body aches its way through into the painting. Flemish painting can almost be defined as that which refuses to blink at physical functions. These are crucially a part of the loveliness and warmth and play of human relations. And it's a very interesting guidepost for the poet himself who says, keep your eye on that kind of picture, and you'll get it right. In that case, you'll know what you're translating. Priam, at thy request, thy son is loosed, and lying on his beard at dawn of day, thou shalt both see him and convey him hence. But now, to our repast. The word is unfortunate, the word is unfortunate, but, but, he doesn't shrink back, for even bright-haired Niobe took food. She did not forget, though of children twelve the rest, her hunger. She did not forget her hunger, though of children twelve the rest. The hunger is allowed, the non-forgetting of it, in the middle of the unimaginable hecatomb. In the 1820s, attempts will be made at prose, the first I know of in 1821, and we now move into the world of the novel. We move into the world where we begin translating the narrative of Homer into the very different pacings and rhythms of fiction. And in fiction there is furniture. And in fiction there are cooking smells. And in fiction, and I think this is absolutely vital, the body begins to have a much more authoritative language of its own, that of introspection, psychology, however rudimentary, which starts to try and analyze the way in which flesh bears on language and on thought. For even fair-haired Niobe felt the need for food. Homer doesn't say that. Here she feels the need for food. The bridge is being built towards our own insistence in the novel on motivation, on a kind of coherence of flesh and spirit. Although 12 children perished in her halls, still she knew she would have to eat after she had grown tired with weeping. And that translation of vast expansion on the laconic perfection of Homer, but clearly the translator is concerned both to give dignity to Niobe's need and to make that need insistent. She is hungry. The weeping makes her hungry. Hundreds of translation follows from the 1890s. We have on latest count 
had since World War II, 14 complete translations of the Iliad and the Odyssey in English and American. There is no end to the attempt. Samuel Butler defines it as a great prose novel, comes up with the extraordinary idea that what we really need to learn to do is translate between the two epics. He thinks the Iliad is a man's work and the Odyssey the work of a woman. He's the first to propose this theory. He's carried away by its enchanting ingenuity and assigns the poem to Nausicaa, the lovely young girl at the Phaeacian court who receives the shipwrecked Odysseus. He believes the poem as we have it was composed by that young woman when she heard Odysseus narrate his adventures. So we have another kind of translation between the archaic war language of men and the much subtler introspective language of a young woman narrating the remembrances of far-off struggles. And we are in a world which is that quite obviously of George Eliot, of the great Victorian interiors, the tent becomes a kind of domestic interior for the present. Let us prepare our supper together. Even lovely Niobe had to think about eating, though her 12 children, six daughters and six lusty sons, had all been slain in her house. And when she was so exhausted, even then, she turned to the table and to her food. Too long, too many explanations, but one sees very well what he's driving at. It is the 19th century interior narrative. I would like to look at many other absolutely fascinating After the Second World War, and I say with some irreverence, I hear rationing in that version. <laughs> and then an extraordinary suggestion by a very fine poet, scholar, translator, E.V. Lucas, as late as 1950, exhausted with ceaseless weeping, Niobe broke her fast. It is the first time in these hundreds of versions I found that. She broke her fast, which is biblical, liturgical, 1950, which projects us into a very different kind of perspective. We're not told she had fasted, it's simply Homer takes it as given that if your children are killed in front of your eyes, your appetite is momentarily abetted. But Lucas pushes it, curiously, towards a deliberate fast to be broken. Venerable king, he said, I've placed your son on a bier under the tilt of your cart. Watch that precision. And in a condition which can call for no complaint, you may drive him away at dawn. Now, sir, what of supper? Remember the case of Niobe, unable to weep more. The weary queen began eating. And we hear a soldier there. And we hear a man who has known what it is to be hungry in the trenches and on long marches, that now, sir, what of supper, I think, would have told us it bears the signature so intensely of Robert Graves and his translation, again a soldier, a poet, a combatant. The American translation by Robert Fitzgerald, with which I wish just to include these examples for a moment, is one of the most beautiful and accomplished we have. The Odysseys, I think, is masterpiece. He labored on the Iliad. The poem of war was to Fitzgerald less convincing, less innerly persuasive than the great poem of Peregrine and seafaring, which was so much like his own life and his own poems. At the first sight of dawn, you shall take charge of him yourself and see him. Now let us think of supper. We are told that even Niobe in her extremity took thought for bread. I found that nowhere else, took thought for bread. 
If anything, the Greeks suggest meat. The taking thought for bread is liturgical again in a very different way from Samuel Butler. But one knows what is in Fitzgerald's mind. I think we know very precisely. It is the mystery of the sacrament, the breaking of bread, the spilling, the drinking of blood, which is so near the Homeric surface. That ancient dream that in the great epics of the past, in the pre-Christian epics, something is adumbrated, not only specifically as in Virgil, whom Fitzgerald also translates magnificently, but already in archaic Homer, that something of the mystery of the breaking of bread and the liturgical table of forgiveness and of love is foreshadowed in the wonder of that Homeric scene. The point is, I think, a very evident one. First, all translations translate previous translations, inevitably. You come after your predecessor. You always will say, and that is the joyous insolence, it has to be, I will do better. Why else should you sit down and do it? You will indeed say very specifically, I shall be more faithful to the original. And that is a shibboleth move, which no sophisticated reader or translator is finally taken in by. Yes, there is progress in philology, perhaps. Yes, you may get a better text. Archaeology may turn up something, in the Homeric case, quite magnificently. Schliemann turns up a great cup, as you remember in Mycenae, which seems to be the cup, we believe, described in this scene. It is known as Nestor's cup. Of course, it isn't, but the fact that it came up out of the darkness of time, reoriented in inflected translations towards a quite different concreteness in that particular instance. Yes, there are ways in which I suppose we know more than Chapman or Hobbes, than Pope or Cooper, than Shelley or Tennyson, about archaeology, about the Trojan War. And I say that tentatively because their knowledge was of a different kind. And thus translations, if you will, are progressive in a certain way, but not in any naive way. There is no innocent contract with fidelity Fidelity to what? Not one of us has ever heard a Homeric line sung as they were sung. Not one of us knows what may have been the first great act of translation from the oral to the written. The modulation from the world of the spoken into that of the script, which is probably of all translations, the great leap, the one that bridges the gap from lived remembrance to the very different relationship of the mind and of the soul to the text, to the text that is at hand that you can open and can reread. So faithful to what? Faithful to one's own moment and time. Faithful perhaps to the condition of one's language, but very rarely so. Too often, too often, we write archaically, consciously or not. Translations are always slightly yesterday, sometimes deliberately the day before yesterday. Whether we would or not, what they are translating is a slightly earlier stage of our own language. They seek monumentality and legitimacy by not yielding too evidently to the present because the present seems to have in it the doom of the ephemeral. So they translate a little backward. This can be miraculous, as in certain cases, and the early translations are found, and how marvelous it would be to dwell together on the translation of the Circe episode in the first canto of Paum, which is deliberately archaic, but in an archaicism, which is a formidable and biting polemic against the decline of the language, as he then felt it being spoken and written. We translate backward, we translate other translators, we see through a series of glasses over the millennia, backward, backward, trying salmon-like to swim upriver to the source, 
And each translation, if you will, if you allow the image, is a fall which we have to leap upward as we try to make our way back to the original spawning ground, to the source of the begetting and the generation. In each text, there will be things we will hear because out of our possibility and others we simply do not hear, we actually do not see because they are no longer in reach of us or temporarily not in reach of us. In a superb preface to his translation of the Odyssey, he did not do the Iliad, though he too was planning to do it, T.E. Lawrence, T.E. Lawrence, then calling himself Shaw, as you know, T.E. Lawrence has a superb preface, a gauntlet cast at all of us, he says, you will be told by the Regis professors of Oxford and Cambridge that I am not a Greek scholar. And he says, now let me tell you what I am. I have killed men in single combat. I have built a raft and escaped down turbulent water. I have crossed a plain pursued by enemies through the night, seeking to spy out their tents. Who is the better translator? And it is a challenge one must always abide with. For he heard and saw things in his flesh, in his hand, which the great scholars, of course, in their workrooms, had never, never sensed or had any smell of. Thus, thus, translation is always a critique of the possibilities of the horizon in one's own moment. In the years immediately following World War II, the Aeneid in Europe had a meaning greater than the Homeric, for it was seen to be the epic of refugees the epic of the homeless, the epic of the dispersed after the destruction of their own world, their own language, their own cities. So the ancient text, or even the nearer text, vibrates around the changing axis of the present need and perception. Sometimes men and women read something better, sometimes they read it badly. And translation is the history of the successive moving in and out of the immediate horizon of our grasp of the other possibility. In each translation, there is a defiant hope that somehow the impossible, the device of appropriation without exploitation has in part at least been achieved. That is to say that the original text will have had in the new language, in the second language, a life which it already had within itself but had not spoken. That sounds like a sophistic paradox. I think it is not. A very great translation gives you the impression of being the realization and unfolding of one of the potentialities which the original, in a sense, did not have time to fulfill. When Borges says that Homer now comes magnificently after Joyce, we know exactly what he means. We know that the Iliad and Odyssey we now have are those that can restart, having at their back the draft that is Joyce's Ulysses, and that we will now see in them the modulations of areas of meaning and narrative and symbolism and wit which were always there, but which somehow had to wait in order to be bodied forth. Such moments are very, very rare, necessarily so. In almost every case, as you know, as all of us in this room know, we're interested in the subject it is one long series of disasters, of defeats, of inadequacies, and what is very much worse, of exploitations. Instead of exchanging trust for trust, we make of the original text an instrument of our own much smaller purposes, political, ideological, pseudo-philosophic, or indeed poetic. We translate downward, in 90% of the cases, we vulgarize, we expand, and in a terrible 10%, our betrayal is the other way we transfigure. 
we translate upward, the translation is greater than the original. And it stands in front of the original, not, not as an opener of the gate, if you want, not someone bidding you enter into the house of its being, but as a kind of great blazing screen saying, look at me, I'm a much greater thing than what I'm translating. And of that, there are stunning and disturbing examples. For example, Rilke as a translator takes something beautiful and slightly minor and makes it blaze in something very, very huge. And I think that is a betrayal of a peculiarly cruel kind because transfiguration destroys the trust which the original had put in you when you first read it. So in the very great majority of cases, <coughs> we fail, and there is no more necessary and demanding craft to begin all over again. Pushkin said the translator is the courier, the letter carrier of the essential. Without him, the news will not travel. It will not reach outward. I would like, in the closing moments, to reward both your generous patience and reward myself by shifting out of my very inadequate words into pure, pure mastery. I will be reading a very recent version, not of these lines, of a very neighboring passage. The translator has dealt with books 16 to 19 of the Iliad. He has not yet given us 24. One of the images here will, I expect, oh, indeed it should, disturb you and perhaps provoke displeasure. By its shocking modernity, let me tell you what the translator has to cope with. Homer has a passage where the horses of Achilles are so swift that their bellies seem to brush the ground and then to rise, the effect of a team of chariot horses at full speed, where indeed you get the impression of a mounting effect away from the dust of the ground. You'll see how he handles that. The passage is one, the great passages in Homer, Patroclus has been slain, Achilles' armor is gone. His mother, Thetis, brings him a new set of divine armor for the express purpose of killing Hector, the one armor that can do it, but which will also, of course, be the signal of his own coming death. Achilles saw his armor. In that instant, its ominous radiance flooded his heart. Bright pads with toggles crossed behind the knees, bodies of fitted tungsten, pliable straps, his shield as round and rich as moons in spring, his sword's haft parked between sheaves of grey obsidian, from which a lucid blade stood out, leaf-shaped, adorned with running spirals. And for his head, a welded cortex. Yes, though it is noon, the helmet screams against the light, scratches the eye so violent it can be seen across 3,000 years. Achilles stands, he stretches, turns on his heel, punches the sunlight, bends, then jumps and lets the world turn fractionally beneath his feet. Noon. In the foothills, melons emerge from their green hidings. Heat. He walks towards the chariot. Greece waits. Over the walls in Troy, mosquitoes hover. Beside the chariot, Soothing the perfect horses, watching his driver cinch, shake out the reins, lay them on the rail, dapple and white the horses are, perfect they are, 
sneezing to clear their cool black muzzles. He mounts. The chariot basket dips. The whip fires between the horse's ears. And as in dreams and at Cape Kennedy they rise, slowly it seems, their chests like royal set. Behind them in a double plume, the sand curls up, is barely dented by their flying hooves. And where that barely touches the world, the wind slams shut behind them. Fast as you are, Achilles says, when twilight makes the armistice, take care you don't leave me behind as you left my Patroclus. And as it ran, the white horse turned his tall face back and said, Prince, this time we will, this time we can, but this time cannot last. And when we leave you not for dead, but dead, God will not call us negligent as you have done. And Achilles, shaken, says, I know I will not make old bones. That miracle is by jazz poet and jazz singer, Christopher Logue. It's a pure miracle. And in it, you have what I think I tried to say, much too awkwardly, without really being able to do it. You have the one complete definition I know of translation. The helmet screams against the light, scratches the eye so violent it can be seen across 3,000 years. Put the word heard there, and we're beginning to get near the heart of our ever renewed theme. I thank you. It starts here, and it, it's just this paragraph here. No, I will not. Well, why not? It is in pellucid English, sir, which I commend to you. But you say that all, all of work has to be translated. I will, with the light, take serious questions. The New Yorker, however, does know that the task of maintaining literacy is a demanding one.
please. And I'll repeat it if you... repeat your question for this part. The question is, do translators really take up previous translations? In the Homeric case and in Dante, without any doubt, they tell us so in detail. Uh, Fitzgerald's preface, Graves' preface, Lawrence's preface, the list is endless. E.V. Ryu, who is the all-time most read translator, is past the three million mark, the prose, Homer, tell us in what way their translations differ from, address, the sem address themselves to previous translations. I can very well see that a translator would say, I want to read none in order to keep my independence, in order to be absolutely fresh and original. I can see that as a strategy. It won't work for the reader. The interested reader has, of course, a culture within which the other translations have already been very active. The translations of Shakespeare in language after language. Pasternak, who cites, tells the previous Russian translations and speaks of their lives inside his own, that each generation in turn. But certainly the other strategy is possible. I would have thought rather unusual, but I may be wrong. I may well be wrong. I thought the example you give of your Faust translation is possibly, and of course we have very, very few Fausts in English, hardly an acceptable one in an earlier period, and that is probably, in the biblical case, it's overwhelmingly, explicitly, the previous texts are being amended, taken into account. I'm, so, But there may, quite right, be exceptions. I would not want to make it a universal point. This is not a directly about translation, but it is attendant upon it uh, uh, concerning the sensibility uh, uh, behind a behind a behind translations. You. You mentioned uh, uh, in your discussion of the translations of Homer that starting with the 1820s, uh, there's a domesticity that comes in, uh, a, a, an early form of psychology. And uh, in one of your essays, in two of your essays uh, on, in on difficulty, you, you lay out the possibility of, of um, uh, the relation of of the develop <coughs> you call for excuse me you uh, you you state that an interesting uh, um, project would be uh, the development of the horist the historicity of inner speech and I was thinking that that could be related to uh, the difference in the mentality between um, 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 uh, what, what one might call a pre-psychological and a psychological mind. But I've never seen that spelled out. Uh, you spoke a bit about the, the, the work of Vygotsky, the Soviet psychologist, who made some pre preliminary sketches uh, of this. And I was wondering if you might rel 
be able to relate some of this uh, uh, to, 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 to uh, to translation. Mr. Askell, it's an immensely difficult subject because the evidence is elusive. Roughly, roughly we talk to ourselves all day and in dream fashion probably all night. 90% um, of speech acts are internal, not outward communication. Uh, we're talking to ourselves probably continuously, consciously or not. The stream is moving inward. The privacies of language play against the available public grammars, but inwardly, all those particularities, the nicknames of our being, of our passions, the memory tags shared with no one else, pour inward. Um, the French writer Chelleris has an extraordinary book where he speaks of letters being very personal certain diphthongs, certain vowels, certain which have childhood needs and associations which you simply can't get out. They ring inside yourself. Um, we translate from what we feel deeply, when it is an important act of discourse, painfully feeling we can't get it quite right. The autistic person has on the whole opted for the truth of inner speech. The autistic person is the refuser of translation. He is almost the most challenging single case of the one who feels the translation is a lie, is a cheapening, is a dispersal, robs the numinous singularity of what he's trying to say and has said to himself. And that if said to the other, it will deceive not only the other, but himself. So the translation also begins at the level between the psyche and the external. We have absolutely fascinating cases of men and women trying to write diaries in private languages, which no one else can read, to have some kind of record of the untranslatable, yet to them absolutely essential. Little is yet understood or known of that, though the work on autism is beginning to be of the very first importance, of the very first importance to anyone thinking about poetry and discourse. Um, I know a few books that matter as much in linguistics, in the finest sense, in poetics, though it has outwardly so little to do with it as Bruno Bettelheim's The Empty Citadel, the great classic study of autism of many, many years ago. Um, we translate, we fail to translate, and sometimes there's a kind of nausea. Each person in this room must have felt it, a feeling I can't get the other person to see it. I can't get them to hear it. It's somehow like a gag, but behind the mouse, in the throat, a kind of gagging of urgent need. I can't get it out there. Um, and in the autistic child, but in others too, in deranged people, in sick people, this translates itself then into the language of the body, into the dance of extreme violence, of uncontrolled violence. Dostoevsky is one of the ultimate masters of showing those moments happening, when violence of the body is another grammar, is another, but it is a desperate grammar. It is the lexicon of despair. Um, because if you don't get it out somehow, you will die. You literally, something in you will wither. Um, these whole fields and how the very, very great poets handle them um, lie still ahead, lie still ahead of us to be explored. Um, Shakespeare is again the pioneer. Uh, there are moments between Lear and the Fool, between father and child, when language breaks down, language breaks down completely, we are very near pure sounds, pure sounds of desperate need, and it's precisely at that moment that there begins the confusion of identities, which makes Lear, when Cordelia is hanged, say, my poor fool is dead. When the child and the fool have become one, cross over in the kind of vibrato of uncertainty at the edges of language. Um, 
but each of us, even as you listen to me as I speak to you, the other stream is constantly pulsing in us. The enormous mass of interior monologue and of its history, I believe, remains completely to be written, and there certainly, there certainly the present very awkward breakdown of trust between men and women is important, as you know, for centuries more in the perhaps in the European and hierarchical system, women simply were not allowed to speak out. It is Pauline and Judaic doctrine, mulia tatsiat in ecclesia, but it is not only ecclesia where the woman is supposed to keep quiet. It was the house, it was a mixed company, something symbolized hideously, hideously, until very recent years. For instance, in high British elite culture, where the reason after dinner women were asked to leave and indeed leave, did leave the men's table room was not as is a myth because he would mind cigar smoke, absolute myth, <laughs> careful cautionary myth, but because serious subjects such as politics were to be discussed. And there you have the whole, the whole gap being institutionalized between admissible discourse and gender. And now, if we knew far more about the destroyed diaries, the letters to themselves of generations of eloquent, muted women in the Ancien Regime situation, we would have evidence, I think, very important evidence, of inner speech patterns and how inner speech can be used to buttress your identity when you are not allowed to speak outward, and with letters and diaries as a kind of halfway house of externalized inner speech. Um, so that, and one has always wondered, hasn't one about Penelope? One has always wondered, and it doesn't take Freudian insights, it takes, I think, ritual and anthropological ones, this has been of course shown, that the strange practice of weaving the great tapestry of narrative during the day and unraveling the narrative each night can also be seen li linguistically as a very peculiar kind, that the forced public discourse is meaningless and the unraveling is the real discourse of that suffering woman in when she can speak unheard. <coughs> and that is why she undoes the narrative of the tapestry each single night. Um, it is a very extraordinary passage. And then, as you remember, um, this is so human, isn't it? Odysseus comes home. She has saved the place for 20 unbelievable years. And of course, all he wants to do is tell her his story. For days and days and days, she's going to have to listen. And I've always wondered what, what she thought about that. <laughs> That's why Molly Bloom does get the last word. <laughs> Please. Uh, at the beginning of the evening, you, you mentioned the fact that God is not transgressible. Yes. And you said you would discuss that. I, as I proceeded, I was, I was ashamed of having even dared um, hold out that possibility. Yes. Um, this is, it comes out of a great passage so often commented on in Dante. Everyone else can be understood. Uh, the pilgrim translates them either into Provençal or into the Vulgate, uh, the few direct quotes from God are left in the biblical. The doctrine, the medieval doctrine was that the speech, the direct speech of God had no longer be heard by men since the death of Christ and the apostles, uh, that it is the only speech as had been that of Adam in which no translation is necessary or possible because what it says is. Now, translation is possible because there are gaps, because there are places we can slip in between words and what they designate. Um, translation is possible because in the lovely question of the American philosopher Stanley Cavell, must we mean what we say? Must we say what we mean? Answer is yes, no, half, a million, tenths, the whole great spectrum of possibility of near meaning, of near falsehood. When God says his saying is the completion of being, is what orthodox and Thomist doctrine is. 
so that in that sense you can't translate it into anything except back always into itself. And one of the reproaches which Plato makes precisely to Homer is he has all these gods speaking so much like us, um, having our kind of twittering gossip and heroic shouts and, and humor and need and they, they yell and so on. It can't be right. It can't be right. But what we call the translation of, of, of divine speech is the sacramental take of this bread it is my body take of this wine it is my blood that too is an act of translation one of the most lasting in all human civilization one of the most complex what we call transubstantiation is a cousin word to translation Christ translates the original statement of identity into infinite variety every time a bread is broken every time a wine is drunk an act of translation is possible so this is a, again, an inexhaustible subject which bears so heavily on the scene I looked at tonight because so many, many more I could mention and many in other languages have seen Priam and Achilles performing when they fall to their food, when they eat, performing some kind of sacramental, as I mentioned, rite of love and of forgiveness over the dead body. Uh, others very much beginning, as you would guess, with Fraser and the Golden Bough, but very much taken up, have on the contrary seen in this a remembrance of cannibalism, a remembrance of the cruel rites whereby the slain enemy is devoured. And the surrogate for this devouring is the bringing in of the meal, the civilized substitute for the more ancient rites. And there are in archaic Greek myths Hints, not more, one mustn't exaggerate that at all, but there are little dark limberings on the far horizon of cannibalism and of at least a remembered nightmare of the cannibalistic, for instance, in the Cyclops episode, of course, but it isn't the only one. Please. I believe it was an after Babel that you uh, said that uh, bilinguality was not necessarily conducive to good translation. This is a rather deep uh, question. I wonder if you mind addressing it, even though our president, in introducing you, said that you were trilingual. Um, I'm drawing there on the best available evidence of the international organizations. They tend not to hire native bilinguals. They say that the native bilingual, like our famous centipede, will start looking at his feet and stop. Uh, that there are sudden effects of blockage, particularly in that mind-destroying, though immensely highly paid craft of simultaneous translation, with one ear, the speed translation of the United Nations, at international meetings, um, and so on, which is a murderous, you can do it 30 minutes at a time maximum, it's usually 20 before your rest periods, such as attacks on the cortex, again in ways we don't quite understand. It falls in doubly and is shifted. They do not like to take native bilinguals because the native bilingual will suddenly be stopped by the complexities and recognitions of nuance which are natural to him and he begins slowing down and falling behind. In the case of self-translation, that's very different. We have some very great artists translating themselves who are bilinguals, um, or almost completely bilinguals. And um, the example most studied, and which is so enigmatic and such fun, because he rightly won't give us any help, he refuses any help, is of course Samuel Beckett. And the question of what language he composes in what he translates from or into in his own inner mind, no one knows. There are all men, I have speculated in After Babel, but this is purely guesswork. I may be making total ass of myself. I've speculated that he, that it's a bit of a private language. I call it a magma, like in a volcano, where he does bits of the two languages. Um, the hint for that is 
the way he translates jokes. Now, jokes are the single most difficult thing in the world to translate. Jokes will not translate. Jokes are the inner nerve of the history of a language, of a history of reference, intonation, dialect, even the way you use your mouth when you tell it, and so on and so on. And we do have a few cases where it's a joke on some district, let us say, of Paris, which is comical for various reasons. Pontoise, as it happens, is one of them, which has many. And so far as we know, in the theatre version, he has a London district name there, in the French, with similar funniness. A Brooklyn joke translated, in the American case, into a Pontoise one, let's say, or Wiener Neustadt which is the source of all Austrian <laughs> somber humor. Um, if this is right, it suggests that in his original shorthand, he shorthands what he wants to get at by crossing between languages. But that, believe me, is only a guess. In other cases, we have great former translations of themselves by writers such as Oscar Wilde and immensely fascinating are the two Salomés, which he did. Uh, but there we know the order. We know which came first, and we know that he was using the first to produce the second. So that's a slightly different example. I'd like to know much more about the way Borges sometimes works, because we do. Borges has made a remark that in some of his most beautiful Spanish sonnets, they are the second version of an English draft, and that the English is the first. Now, that would be extremely intriguing, it would give him the strangeness, the distance. It would give him the aura uh, of something which is just a little out of reach of a first reading, something like that. But that, honestly, it's guesswork. On the whole, all solid law, and it's law or hiring practice, says the best translator is the one who has admirably studied the target language but is not native in it. In the Christopher Lowe, with, with which, in, in admiration of which I concur, isn't it true that Peter Levi did the, does an initial Greek translation of Christopher Lowe's name? It's two men, Joanna, it's Peter Levi and uh, Donald Kahn Ross who commissioned them. And they did a word for word for him, as for Robert Lowell's Russian, was done word by word. Um, yes, but he then forgets about what he has heard. That's the extraordinary thing. He lets it sink into a certain, almost forgetting it, in order to do this. Um, the Cape Kennedy, um, I've talked to him about it because I, I told him, now you're caught. It's Canaveral now. No, this is important. Now, Matthew Arnold, in a famous discussion of this, says don't use an effect that is too graphically immediate. That's the one that may change. Now, that's a very difficult problem. It is such a magnificent, it's an unbelievable find, because he had in mind the way these damn things rose with the double plume of smoke, the dust coming off the base. It is so magnificent. It is by far the greatest capture of a horse of the horses beginning to go that way through speed. And he could change it to Canaveral, I think. Difficult because it's very, very prosodically paced and Kennedy isn't Canaveral. But there is in trouble. There is in trouble. Um, on the other hand, uh, in another passage where he suddenly uses a mushroom, he doesn't need cloud, but the mushroom, the atomic thing is on so far. The mushroom needs no explanation and tragically, presumably, will be with us for a very, very long time. So the translator is caught between Skilla and Charybdis, the Skilla of having the wonderful reference and the Charybdis of saying, wait a minute, if it's that good, it may not last. Um, but let me say, all of you or whoever of you has been in China, um, if the Chinese communicate on this matter at all, they will say that Ezra Pound's Fenelosa's French version, some English, Hans Bethke in German, 
And then comes the miracle. The Chinese say his is right. And that of the great scholars who do know Chinese and have spent their lives assembling the philological authority are stone dead. No explanation on that. No explanation whatever which made Ezra Loomis Town of Idaho and, and upstate Hamilton College, New York, the reincarnation of Lu Chi and Wen Po. I mean, the, there you are. Then, then there's no explanation. I think if there's one more, shall we take it? Because. I think of settings as a supreme act of translation. Now you've got some really complicated ones when they translate the original before setting. <coughs> there are very many translations of Schubert, as you know, into other languages, then set. A great composer is a supreme reader of poetry. And one of the first lessons in taking translation seriously is to sit down with students and do, let us say, 10 versions of a great Heine poem by 10 great composers, which you can easily do. Or, even more exciting, take the same poem five times across Hugo Wolf's life, from the very young to the very last days before his madness and death, so that you know how he's reading it across his own life, hearing his own previous readings. Anyway, and that's, of course, exciting beyond words because the setting of stress marks, the breaking up of breathing, the emphases are very great acts of translation. It can also go awfully wrong, terribly wrong. And poets can get it magnificently wrong. Having at his disposal Schubert versions, Beethoven versions, and Berlioz versions, not bad, Johann Wolfgang Goethe solemnly declared the only ones that had understood him was the musician Celta. And were it not for Fischer Diskau's uncontrollable generosity, um, not one Celta song would be available to us. He has now recorded those. And you sit there and say, Goethe, Goethe, <laughs> says Schubert, Beethoven, and those aren't as good as this. And one can only fall silent in front of a complete act of non-translation. That's a real worry. <laughs>